Okay, thank, thank you so much. Can you hear me clearly? The acoustics is fine. Okay, great. So we are here uh, to chiefly talk about the Indian family, uh, that uh, force which uh, crowds restaurants uh, and uh, is I think the single larger, uh, largest consumer of maida and sugar and sweets and uh, the this fountainhead of high carb love, you know, and uh, what it is also is uh, it's a cartel. Uh, the Indian family is a cartel uh, because uh, it uh, it was forged around the time when the nation, when the state was not so dependable, and uh, the family's business was to ensure that its young got an unfair advantage uh, and that it survived survived India. The, the chief objective of the Indian family, in my opinion, is to survive India. And as India got better, uh, the family slightly became confused. And that happens all over the world. When the society improves, when the nation improves, when the economy improves, we appear to think that people are becoming more individualistic. But what is happening is the family's reasons for existing is facing very severe competition from the government. And we are, we are going through those very interesting times. Uh, and Gacha Gochar, in fact, I have no problems pronouncing this because this, these words have actually no meaning uh, because these words are the invention of a character of Vivek Schoenbach, and it's a very interesting context where this man is newly married, his wife is very beautiful, he's disrobing her, and he is at, what is the ugliest word in English language is petticoat, which I think is a wrong word to use. I think someone has to give a more elegant word for something so beautiful. But anyway, the strings get stuck. Uh, so it's not, it's not. So he says, she says it's all gachar, gachar, gochar. And what she means is it's all a not, it's a mess. Uh, so, uh, and the novel is a very beautiful portrayal of one uh, Indian family. Uh, and uh, there are many moments that probably only we would identify as Indians or maybe actually, uh, maybe a generation would identify more, to be precise. Uh, Vivek, I want to start off with what is, uh, if at all such a generalization is possible, what is unique about the Indian family? Yeah, I, I think uh, what you said, that uh, the children have a, uh, an advantage, right? So, so that, uh, the, the rest of them can protect them and take care. I think that is something which is at the core of uh, the, the Indian family. And uh, it, it also is like the family protects and protects to such an extent that even when the children and the family members, even when they go beyond a certain limit, they still are together and protecting them. And I think it is not uh, something that we see today, even from the days of uh, Mahabharata. If, if you see, that is something that is that is inherent in uh, in the Indian mind. Uh, you look at uh, Dhirodhana and what his uh, father and, and, and mother do, uh, despite all his uh, uh, you know crimes, is something that uh, we also do today. I think that is something which is uh, at the center of uh, the family, that is protecting the family members, uh, whatever it is. Well, that's very interesting, actually, because the Indian middle class makes so much fun of Rahul Gandhi because he was privileged. Uh, the entire Indian middle class society is filled with Rahul Gandhi's, where success is sexually transmitted. So, okay, that's uh, that's that's fascinating. Uh, in this, uh, maybe not exactly in this context, are there things as uh, a Kannada writer you feel you can't uh, is taboo? You can't write about the family that even someone like you would be intimidated and say, this is the line, I can't say, I can't say some stuff. I, I don't think so. I don't think there is any, any taboo as such that, 
you know, as a writer, I can't uh, cross or I can't, I can't touch. <coughs> but there is a, a in, in, in literature, in especially I can talk about Kannada literature that, that I've been seeing, that people don't really get in and uh, unravel things like this. Because one is that uh, you really need to have a lot of courage to do it. Because today when we say family, it is we are talking about nucleus families, right? And for a writer to really confront this and talk about uh, herself, or, or his own uh, uh, self and, and people around him, it is a very difficult thing. So at this point, I should tell you what the book is about. I mean, in fact, I, uh, when, when people ask me what, what is your novel about, I find it so foolish that I, I'm always very reluctant to introduce a novel because a novel is many other things apart from what it is about. Um, it traces the fortune of a very simple middle middle class family uh, from around the time when the middle class was closer to the poor uh, and uh, probably to a time when middle class is actually closer to the rich uh, but this family has prospered and what happens when a family prospers is one of the themes that the book deals with how it changes uh, people and uh, it has many moments, many Indian moments. Like for example, uh, the, one of the characters has a relationship before he gets married where they were only holding hands or did they even hold hands, it's ambiguous, but it was a relationship. She was a girlfriend and he was a boyfriend. Uh, so what, uh, how old is such a relationship? Do you think such a relationship between a boyfriend, girlfriend, or consider them as boyfriend, girlfriend because she does get angry with him at something so that so that so that really defined but they not even held hands is it still possible in bangalore of your times i think it is still possible because it has happened in the novel uh, <laughs> it is see we are talking about a family which is uh, in transition and uh, there are two two kinds of things if you really go to a village in, in smaller places, I feel that the relationship between a boy and a girl is much more uh, easily possible. One can easily hold hand and do many more things. But in a city, in a lower middle class, it is uh, it is not that easy. It is possible in a slightly you know upper middle class or upper class. But but that the the class that I am talking about in in this particular novel, I think it is uh, that is my perception and understanding. It is it is difficult. Oh okay. In case you guys are wondering what that gentleman is doing along with us, uh, he, uh, Srina, is a wonderful writer and he has translated the Kannada novel into English. Uh, but I must tell you that that was the first Kannada book which he finished uh, reading in Kannada and he ended up translating that. So Srina, can you just tell us something about uh, uh, why you you did it? Uh, you are essentially a typical English medium guy who reached out to Canada because that was your language. Why did you do it, and how did you end up? How did Vivek let you translate the book? How did Vivek let you translate the book? Uh, no, well, I mean, I, I also write my own stuff in English, and I have been writing for a while. I published some short stories and so on, but uh, my mother tongue is Canada, and I felt I'd lost it through my schooling to some extent. I was, there were times when we were actually fine for speaking in Canada, even on the playground and so on. So I wanted to get closer to Canada, but my reading speed was so excruciatingly slow that I knew that I needed a project of some sort in order to you know, get, in, get into some sort of comfort uh, with Canada. So I was interested in translating a book, which is when Vivek, who's a friend, asked me if I would translate his book. I told him that, you know, I don't know if my Kannada is good enough. And he said, you don't even need to know Kannada. It's all right if you know English, so the destination language. So, so that's how that happened. But also, it's the first book I've translated. And uh, it's been a very, it's been a journey of pleasant discovery. One of the things I discovered is that a translator is probably the slowest and most intense reader of a book. 
because you otherwise you'll never read a book at the rate of one page a day or something across a span of time. In fact, so much so that there are bits of the book that keep coming up into my mind when you know, at random occasions. And one of these happened two days ago, and which struck me as some sort of response to your first question about the Indian family as well. I was boarding this Air India flight from New York to Delhi. They have this really long direct flight, and it's full of uh, Indians because the sector it's on. And there was one particularly large family, I think, that had been, uh, I mean, it was la so large that it could not all be accommodated in one uh, section of the plane. So there were two or three people here and there. So this led to massive reorganization. So there was this one guy who was going around saying, okay, are you alone? Okay, will you go sit there? And where's your luggage? Can we put your luggage there? And there was this chaos in the plane. And his explanation to each one was, family ko alag kar diya. And family ko alag kar diya. So the whole idea was that this family was somehow a, a unit that went all by itself. And this brought to mind uh, a section from Vivek's book, which I was just picking out now. It happens when there's, a, there's some conflict in the book and the family has to stand together. And there's a new entrant to the family. And, and the narrator says that you know, she wouldn't understand what you just did. For that, she would need to have lived these days with us, when the whole family stuck together, like a single body across the tightrope of our circumstances. And that seems to be a good characterization of the Indian family to me. Would you like to, uh, uh, would you like to read uh, the Kannada uh, portion for the, uh, just for the sound of it? Uh, I'll read a few sentences so that you know how it sounds in Kannada. ಹೀಗೆ ಹೇಳಿ ಹೋದ ಅಪ್ಪ ಸಂಜೆ ಎಂದಿಗಿಂತ ಬೇಗ ಬಂದ ನಡುಮನೆಯಲ್ಲಿ ನಾನು ಹೋಮ್ವರ್ಕ್ ಮಾಡುತ್ತಾ ಕುಳಿತಿದ್ದೆ ಐದು ಬಾರಿ ಆಗಿರ್ಬೋದೇನೋ ಅದು ಅಪ್ಪ ಮನೆಗೆ ಬರುವ ಹೊತ್ತಲ್ಲ ಒಳಗೆ ಬಂದವನೇ ಕುಮುದ ಎಂದು ಅಮ್ಮನನ್ನು ಕರೆದ ಇದು ಎಂದಿನಂತಿರಲಿಲ್ಲ ಅಮ್ಮ ಮತ್ತು ಮಾಲತಿ ಅಡುಗೆ ಮನೆಯಲ್ಲಿದ್ದರು from the south, but yeah. Uh, I feel awkward speaking in English. Now suddenly just, I think I'll be fine in a few seconds. Um, the, there, are, there are many uh, moments in the book uh, that are deep observations of life. Uh, uh, I, there's a place where uh, after, after the family has prospered, the narrator makes an observation that uh, uh, relationships between things um, have become casual because there are so many objects in the house and you are now rich and you don't have the same relationship with objects that you uh, used to have when you were not so rich and there were just fewer things. Uh, I think it is a sort of observation probably a whole generation would uh, would not uh, probably get, maybe it is a, it's a thing of time and space, not just economics. Can you tell us more about uh, uh, this condition? I grew up in a, in a village. Uh, first 17 years I was, uh, I spent my time in coastal Karnataka. And uh, I uh, studied in Kannada medium in a government school. And the place was so small that it was, uh, there was only one car in the entire town which belonged to a doctor. And uh, I feel that the access that I had to the community and to the houses and, and to the people is completely different to what I see or what my children have got uh, living in, in the cities. And if you, if you see in, uh, in smaller places, you will not find anything that is not functional in the house. Yeah, everything has to have a function, it has to have a utility, otherwise that has no place in that house. Uh, villagers will find it funny if you say I am going for a walk. 
because there is nothing like going for a walk, right? You you work and and, and it is it's really fun. Even for me, it is sometimes very difficult to do it, but I do it because otherwise, you know, I, I can't exercise. But that's what I mean. So there was there is something I have grown up in a, in a uh, in a way where everything around me, everything around my family, everything around my mind was integrated in such a way that it has, uh, uh, I, I, I saw it as one unit, which is what I think is reflected in some way uh, when I talked about uh, this family. And for me, that relationship with objects, that relationship with uh, things around you is very important because we, we, uh, it has, it, it requires, because literature requires a certain kind of engagement with things around, because an experience is not just, you know, what is, what is in the mind, but also what is, you touch, you feel, smell, so everything. So, so as a writer, for me, those things are very, very important. Even a chair, where you sit, what it means, uh, right? So, uh, that I think is, has gone in this, and, uh, when, when people move across uh, class, uh, the relationship uh, changes and it is uh, not so easy to handle. But we are losing that connect now, isn't it? Because one is uh, the objects now, they don't endure that long. Uh, and two, we don't need to keep things uh, that long anymore. Uh, at least, at least the middle class doesn't. You think a lot of uh, a lot of things are now moving down the society because it's the poor, which is the new uh, lower middle class. Uh, so, so uh, uh, do, do you see that happening around you? Uh, yeah, I see. I see it happening around around a lot because see, when I say relationship it is with an object, it also means an activity, our physical activity and our engagement with that particular object, like, right? Whether it is a pen, whether it is a, a phone or, or a chair or, or whatever, right? So the more we use and throw, the less we engage with it. And there is, uh, see, don't, don't mistake me that I'm not saying you should have an emotional engagement with, with an object, right? That's not what, I, what I'm trying to say. But, but the kind of engagement that the mind has with the things, it is, for example, it is very difficult to say that I use the same chair for 25 years as against, uh, you know, I, I change it every uh, second year. Right? There, is, there is a lot of uh, difference there. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. And I agree with you that it is changing. And for me as a writer, I think it is not, it is not good. When I was growing up in uh, Madras, uh, some of the objects in uh, the homes of people were also called grandparents. Uh, you enter a room and then suddenly there are these two old people. They don't move, they don't talk, they just look at you. And for five, eight, ten years in that same colony, I've not seen them do anything else. They are just in that room, they are unmoving. Actually, there's one character who comes close to that, the father in the... Uh, in, in the novel uh, is an idealistic retired salesman who, uh, whose opinion is not sought out and even now actually they think he, he's, so, he's so idealistic that they think that he's going mad and they try to uh, encourage him uh, not to lose meaning in things so that he's still sane and he still survives. So can you tell us about the unmoving characters who are always on the fringes of the scene where life is happening but there are always these characters around aren't they they're almost like objects I know it sounds disrespectful I, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful but uh, they do remind me of objects see it is like in life there are many people who are on the periphery right and uh, I won't still call them objects it's <laughs> uh, and, and these characters in, in, in the story, I mean, you are, a, you are a fiction writer, so you know uh, what it means. It is like, uh, uh, you can't live, it's like saying I walk only, only with my legs, right? So that's not uh, what it means. We need the whole body to, to walk. So all these characters are like that. They are like fingers and eyelids and ears and, and, and whatnot. So that is, I won't call them 
characters on the fringe, they are, they are there, but they are a center of another circle. But that circle is not shown to the reader, but the writer must see that circle. If he doesn't see that circle, where these characters are the center, then they will not get integrated with your story. And it is a very important thing for a writer to see. Srinath, as a writer in English, in English language, uh, uh, as a person who can read Kannada, which, which is your mother tongue, uh, do you sometimes feel a bit, uh, this is there a sense of longing? Like for, when I watch a great Tamil or a Malayalam film, I feel bad that I, somehow I'm, I'm, I've chosen a language, a medium, where I can't reach some elements of storytelling which are possible only in those languages, you know. When I, when I know how much, uh, I mean, some of the other things, I mean, I'm, I'm quite glad that I write in English, okay, but, but uh, yes, can you tell us something about that? Yeah, I do, I do feel that quite a lot, actually. The, uh, the fact that, uh, as I said, in, in a sense, my mother tongue was, uh, was denied to me in school in a, in a way because English was pushed because it is a more uh, useful language in so many ways. And, and I think we have a serious lack of cultural resources that allow us to reflect on our lives. And many of these can only come in the language that is around you. If your life is lived in a particular language, it is very hard for another language to come in and provide a kind of uh, impetus for reflection or uh, that allows you to calibrate your moral compass and things like this. And I think a lot of it is much, much easier to do in the language that is uh, around yourself. So for example, I read uh, You Are Anath Murthy Samskara uh, only quite recently. And when I read it, I was thinking how useful it would have been to me as a a young person growing up in a similar world. Uh, it, it would have made sense of so many things that I struggled with for the longest time. So I think it's really important to have, and I think that's one of the reasons why, you know, someone like Chetan Bharat is so popular as well. Uh, I was myself in an engineering college when I read his first book. And I was quite a sophisticated reader at the time in English. And I knew that this was not very sophisticated, but still I have not encountered any literature that uh, was about the world I was living in and used those elements to do something with it. So and this aspect of it thrilled me. So, so I think language plays a huge role there as well. It, it's not that it cannot be done in English, it can, but I think there is, uh, there is a level of mediation there which makes things inconvenient perhaps. I've always felt that uh, hysteria is a dialect of Tamil, you know, that there are, yeah, there are things that they do and they say. Like, for example, like one guy, Idli guy, he asked me for 100 rupees. I gave him a long time back. So he was supposed to give it the next uh, week and he saw me, I mean, he was not meant to see me. And then this whole drama of because he couldn't, you know, the, he's not putting it on, he's just, you know, they're dramatic. Uh, and once when Jalalita went on fast, I still remember, she was a bit large even then. There were hundreds of malnourished women going around and beating their breasts, asking her to, I mean, they were making signs to her, and, and they're not actors. They, there are also actors, in, in, I know you figure, you, I always feel they figure the actor they're imitating, you know this guy's whole family life. You know, there is so much beauty in that society, which is also fast changing. Where, but as writers in English, English enforces a certain sophistication on you, whether you want to or not. You know, there's a certain uh, cultural elegance, or you want to call it elegance, sophistication. So, and when you still fight against it, and when you still try to get that culture out, it sounds as though you have made it up, and it can't be that way. You know, that when a guy opens the mouth, you're describing the saliva or everything, no, it, it seems too much in English. Would you share that view? Deal with the sophistication of a medium. With, here, I'm not asking you this question as, as a translator, man. I don't want you to answer this question as a translator, but as a writer in English. How do you deal with the Indian uh, condition uh, expressed through a very sophisticated language? I mean, I, I do think it can be done, and I think one of one of the people who showed the way for this was R.K. Narayan, where he did talk about some very hysterical families and he wrote about it in you know, perfectly natural and simple English and uh, managed to do it. And, and I do think it's, 
easy to use words that are English to develop larger contexts that are, uh, sorry, words that are in the language in which things are happening and to use, uh, you know, larger scenes where, uh, and it also depends on whom you're writing for, I think, if the intended audience is from that culture and they know what you're writing already, then I think there is a familiarity and a recognition already and it makes the task much easier. I think when a writer writes in a language, there are certain things that uh, she or he takes for granted. And uh, that is very important because that is closely linked to the experience about which you are writing. And if you don't have this uh, uh, facility, and if you don't have this advantage, then you tend to over explain. Right? So, uh, and when you try to over explain, the magic of uh, writing goes away. Yes, do, do you feel sometimes Indian writers in English over explain? Because they are actually all the time interpreting. See, in some writings I have seen, it depends on who is your reader in your mind, right? Uh, if your reader is uh, here in India, then there is a certain style. Because English is not a language which is so much distant to us. It is, it is one of the Indian languages, right? It is there. It is, uh, so I don't think that is a problem of English. I think it's a problem of a writer. Can I just elaborate on this with respect to this book and the translation itself? So it's, it came out first in India in English and then uh, it's going to appear in the, it's, it's going to come out in the US and then the UK and we've been editing those versions. So it's very interesting to note what changes editors want when the book goes from here to there. So it's set in a lower middle class home and it's described that there's not much furniture in the house. And, and to an Indian who's seen something similar when you say that somebody is sitting and cooking something, you assume that there is a stove on the floor and somebody is sitting down. The US editor immediately wrote back saying there's no chair in that room, how could she be sitting down and cooking? So, so the assumptions of that culture say something completely different. So you have to explain it a little bit. You may have to say sit on the floor. So, so there are a bunch of places in the book where something like this happens, where a cultural familiarity would make it far more concise, I think. The book also deals with one menacing aspect of the Indian family, or actually any family, which is that when it is threatened, uh, they can be deadly. They come together. They may not like each other, but when the family is threatened, they come together and you're screwed, basically. Uh, can you tell us something about that fascinating aspect of the Indian family? As I said uh, in the beginning, it is they come together and they're really, if I can use the word, gang up, right, against uh, the so-called enemy. That is, that is something which is inherent uh, in, in a family. Also, there is uh, another aspect to it, which uh, brings them together, which, uh, you know, the, the sentence that uh, Srinath uh, read out, which is we, we like suffering uh, a lot. Indians have a different, uh, we can see that in demonetization, right? We, we, we like it. And we think that it is good to, to suffer. We don't want our children to go to a school where they enjoy. <laughs> the, really, the school that tortures the most, we think, is the best school. And, and really, it is, I'm really serious about this, because these are the things which are, which are interlinked. And uh, when a family goes through this and, and uh, comes to a, a position where they have to go through certain things, they come together and as I said, they gang up and that's what happens. So do you mean that it's actually because we are trained to believe that uh, something which makes you suffer would lead to something good in the end because that is how the society was at, at one point. Is it because of that or is it just we kind of like whipping each, ourselves like the Brits? No, I think it is very deep rooted in our psyche, in our society. I mean, take our, for example, our mythologies. There is not a, a, a single saint who has got anything, you know, straight away. So you have to, you have to really go through that kind of tapas yeah. and, you know. He has to first up, become an anthill. And, and then all kinds of things. Right. So 
So it is, there's nothing, no enlightenment comes uh, easily. Yeah. You know, it's almost as if the whole, uh, the mode of being of an Indian family is set up for adversity. That, that is when it works best. When things are really bad, I think the Indian family works fantastically well. The rest of the time, it's uh, quite dysfunctional, I think. It's like walking around, it's like going to the market for shopping, wearing full body armor or something. It's incredibly cumbersome, you're bearing a huge burden, and it's only when things go really wrong that I think its default instincts serve it well. The rest of the time, it's just counterproductive, I suspect. Yeah, that's, I think that is, in fact, people have been searching for what's Indian in us and they're, they're finding answers in stupid things like cricket and other things. But actually, it's this, you got it, actually. I think it's a great moment of epiphany that no matter where you go in India, except for Kashmir, I uh, can't figure them out because they're kind of, uh, uh, they suffer anyway, inside, outside. Uh, I don't think they have. So otherwise, it's, uh, they, uh, I think there's something happens to the Indian family when they suffer, that they feel that, something good is going to come out of it. Yeah. Uh, that's, uh, I always, because I lived in Bombay, um, uh, and now I live in Gurgaon. Uh, when I was in Bombay, I thought that that city is very good for marriage. Because when there is a problem, you can't go anywhere. As in, you can't, you can't hide in the house because the house is as big as a fridge. So, uh, so you're just there and there can be these long silences, but Bombay will tire you out if you're silent. You have to come out of it. Uh, bathroom, yes, you know that, but how long can you be in the bathroom if you're not an adolescent? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, and what happens to this family? They were also in a small house. Now they go to a big house. And so everybody has their cell. So nobody can see anybody. So too much individuality for an Indian family. Can you tell us something about how spaces, just because you're living the way you should, with a lot of space and your own space, this thing about you, our own space, does it even sound right to us? I never understood my own space. Uh, what does it mean? I think in this uh, particular instance, in this particular novel, it is, all this that come together which uh, separates them. It is the space which, uh, uh, the, the space that they get, the space in quotes that we're talking about, which they don't know how to handle, right? So if you are, if you have lived in a certain way and then uh, you get this space, then you don't know how to, how to handle that space, right? And it can also be the other way. And, uh, the, the family has been living in a certain way and then, in, then they move into this and, and all that. So that's one. Second is, a lot of our relationships happen in our mind. It is while some things happen, uh, uh, you know, when, when you are interacting and when people are in front, a lot also happens in our mind. And if it doesn't happen in our mind, then that relationship uh, doesn't really, uh, you know, go very far. Uh, so it, it, both are both are very important, and uh, the physical space feeds to this uh, imagination uh, or, or the reconstruction of the relationship in the mind. And when that breaks, a lot of things happen. That's what happens in the. In the, mind. Uh, the book also makes a very uh, uh, very fascinating point of view. It's almost like a rebuke to many of us, and almost almost trying to tell us something about the exhilaration of marrying someone whom you have not touched before. You know, it's like how exciting everything is, you know. Oh, her head was bent down, she was wearing this and she's that and the smell and everything about marriage. And suddenly when you're reading this, you begin to understand why uh, marriage uh, was the way, it, uh, it, it, it is the way it is, the way it was designed. Srinath, I want to ask you when, uh, when you were translating, say, this portion, you know, uh, how to, what was going through your head? How did you read the book when you saw moments like this and other moments that you would like to talk about? Moments that stayed with you. Uh, yeah, that, that is actually a very powerful moment in the book. And, uh, and I'd always wondered how arranged marriages work, what happen, you know, what really goes on. And, uh, and so this book has a pretty convincing answer, I think. And it's, uh, 
uh, you get uh, stuck in the underskirt. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and there's and there's actually a really nicely done sex scene as well, uh, which I really enjoy translating, by the way. <laughs> Great. Uh, one last question. After that, we'll have a reading, and after that, you can ask your questions. One. Uh, uh, another observation from the book is the well being of any household. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just paraphrasing because I can't understand my own handwriting. Uh, the well being of any household uh, is dependent on selective acts of blindness and deafness. Uh, so we know this is true from the lives of our parents and maybe even our own lives. Blindness and deafness as things which are very important to the well-being of a family. Uh, Vivek, can you tell us about uh, where this thought come, came from? I think it has uh, come from my own experience. <laughs> I see it everywhere. And whenever one uh, tries to defy this, there are problems. So you, you are the deaf and the blind person or are you the victim of the... I think both. Can you be... Uh, are you married? I'm sorry, I didn't ask you that question. Oh, yes. Oh, okay. So you, you, you're, you're deaf and blind to your wife. You're a very, very brave man. Yeah. Uh, How does that work? What's the, what's the trick? What's the trick? <laughs> I don't think I can reveal everything here. But <laughs> on a serious note, I think it is... Uh, it is also to do with... Uh, uh, in this, in this uh, uh, particular context that there are certain things that a writer uh, reveals in a, in a work, right? And uh, you don't say uh, certain things. And uh, uh, it is important, what is really most important, don't say, not what you say. Because uh, it is only through words and sentences that we can, that I, I or any writer like me, try to capture something which I myself uh, have not fully understood, right? So I think that is uh, very much uh, linked to this, not directly, I know, but then it, it is something at the back of my mind uh, when I write like this. Yes, yeah, so I'm just going to read a small bit. I was supposed to read another one where the uh, small house that they live in has a massive ant invasion. But I think I'll, since we talked about arranged marriages, maybe I'll read a small fragment from... Uh, so they've just met once before and now they're getting married. Anita is the name of the bride and the narrator is getting married. On our wedding day, Anita managed to look more beautiful than I'd been able to imagine her. She carried herself with poise. Her thick braid hung down to her waist. She was wearing lipstick. The first chance I got, I stole a sideward glance at the blouse under her dark blue side. We had few chances to speak during the ceremony, and these went in saying things like, so much smoke, who is that teasing you, a classmate? There was a strange charm even in exchanging inanities. The ceremony required me to hold her hand at times, or touch her arm with my index finger, and these brief moments of contact would be the cause of an immense thrill. When it was time to tie the thali around her neck, I leaned in close and a whiff of fragrance went straight to my head. The scent of flowers and the close presence were almost too much. For a brief instant, I felt unsteady on my feet. She stood there with her head bowed. Flecks of turmeric dotted the down on her cheek. My fingers brushing against the back of her neck, I tied the knot. At lunch, when we had to feed each other sweets, the tips of my fingers touched her lower lip for a moment. The jolt this produced took a while to subside. I was still helpless when she brought a piece of jalebi to my mouth. I seized her hand and pretended to bite off her fingers. A few girls nearby went, oh, so sweet, and I felt embarrassed by my own antics. The wedding photographer, anchoring for such moments, made me feed her again. Great. Uh, we'll take some questions. Usually I say that uh, it's all right for you to uh, uh, masquerade your opinions as questions, which is what usually happens. But I think to save time, I think we'll give questions a chance and see where it goes.
Good afternoon. Uh, I'd just like to ask you, uh, Mr. Perur, when you were doing the translation, since the language was not something that was uh, you're very comfortable with or that you know you really know uh, as well, uh, how were you able to capture the nuances of what each language or each writer actually has and what he wants to say? Did you create a new set of nuances if I was to read this book? No, no. No, I know the world of the book very well. I'm just not uh, very comfortable with the language it's written into. I, I, and I, by that I just mean I know the words and I know what's going on, but I'm just a very slow reader and I'm not a very experienced reader in Canada. And I suspect this may actually have helped me because I took a long, long time to read, understand, look at it in different ways. So uh, I, I think in some ways maybe, you know, I couldn't just breeze through the book when I read it. So I. I lingered for a while with uh, every sentence, every scene, and it probably helped me a little bit. And so it's not necessary that you came out with your own nuances. What do you mean by nuances? You know, there's, each language has a, I'm speaking English, but there is a nuance in what I'm saying. Similarly, I would un imagine it would be in Kannada too. So do you get that essence, having not been primarily the same language speaker, writer, thinker, dreamer? No, no, but I get it in Canada. Okay. So my Canada is in my Okay. Great. <laughs> and, right. and right. the challenge is to uh, be able to replicate that, to internalize it first and yes. be able to replicate it in English. Be because the elements of uh, what you call nuances are different in these languages. Yes. So a kind of blind replication would, you know, uh, make a serious writer in one language sound silly in another. So you you take a serious writer and you produce a serious text in another language, so. Okay, great, thanks. Actually an observation, not a question. Uh, my name is Manisha Jhadakur, and I just wanted to say that, you know, you've all kind of, uh, as writers, thought about a lot about, you know, language and how you express yourself. I just wanted to say I'm glad that you do write in English and that it gets translated into English because then it's accessible to me. In Canada, I would never have got this book. So it's good. And uh, across the world, I think it creates access to different cultures. We may not get the exact nuances, but it's still uh, better than not going getting anything at all. And until unless you write things like, you know, steamed uh, cottage cheese dumpling in uh, sugar syrup, and you can write rasgulla and leave it at that, we should be fine with that. So please keep it up. Hello, so I would like to pose the same question to Vivek. Uh, so how do you see the translated book? Does it catch the, the uh, you know, the, um, the essence of what you have tried to put in the book and what has Srinath put in it? Yeah, can you just leave the... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, see, I, I talked about uh, taking things for granted sometime back, right? So a writer works a lot uh, with these things, with taking things for granted. At the time of translation is the time when uh, I know what are those things that work and what are these, those things that don't work. If you imagine a gate like this and, and a work passes through the gate, all these things you have to leave it behind, what is so specific and, and then it, it, it passes through. And still you want to say what you have, what you wanted to say. So you have to really decorate it with something else, right? And since I can also read English and we could, uh, you know, uh, discuss that. So I think uh, to that extent it is, it was uh, very effective. And if you really, if I recall the discussions that uh, uh, I have, we have been having uh, between me and Srikant, uh, sorry, Srinath is, not about uh, what is the meaning of a sentence or a meaning of a word or you know, it is more about uh, what is uh, which is not said there in in, in the work and uh, many of my secret uh, secrets as a writer I have shared with him which i would not have otherwise uh, shared with anyone else no but i can tell you the nature of the secrets i mean 
things that he had uh, done with a specific intention, which uh, is not obvious, but it kind of builds up subconsciously and so on. So he actually explained those things. So it, it, it was a great uh, lesson in how somebody writes very good fiction for me. Uh, so my question is, uh, all of you talked about the f notion of the family and the family coming together in times of crisis, but uh, don't you think that's kind of an idealized notion of a family? Because there are families which do not come together at times of crisis too. It is true. And uh, I think uh, when I write a story or a novel or a book, it is not about, though we have discussed uh, families in general, the book is about a specific family. It is, this story is the story of the people who are here. It is about these characters, about this father, mother, wife, you know, sister. And it is not a story of a general Indian family, I would say. Because if at the moment I start thinking about saying that this family is, uh, you know, an Indian family, then I have completely lost it. I, ha I can only write if I can see them as people, as, uh, uh, you know, in, in with the flesh and blood. So it is a story of these people. It is not the story of uh, any family. Uh, general, yeah, it's Indian. It's, it's these characters. Uh, so to answer your question, yes, some families come together, some families uh, don't come together. In this case, they have come together. 